Good morning or good afternoon, everybody, uh, wherever you are. Um, I'd like to welcome you to our event today, Life on a Farm, Nature-Based Solutions um, to the Climate Challenge. This is one of a series organized by the Mission of Canada to the EU on common environmental related policies. And it's co-hosted by IEP and the International Affairs Branch of Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, which is the Agriculture Ministry at the federal level. And I'm David Baldock, a senior fellow at IEP, and I'll be the facilitator today. Uh, what, what we hope to do is to have a, a conversation between um, experts we're very lucky to have with us today from, from each side. And we will start with uh, a speaker from one side, just in, in a conversation with me, answering two or three questions about uh, their particular angle on the topic. And we have people on the policy, from the policy side, farming side, and the more academic expert side. And we'll alternate between Canada and the, the EU. And then towards the end, I hope we'll have some time for broader questions and answers, but I'd ask people to hold back their, uh, any, any questions, comments, answers they have and, until the end. And if you do at the end uh, want to bring up an issue, ask a question either for the panel generally or for an individual, then do use the raise hand function um, um, on, on the Zoom. And if you'd like to just make a more general comment for the audience as a whole, uh, or to uh, post something or, or put up a reference, then do use the chat for that. The, the, we'll be looking at the chat from time to time. People are gonna speak for about um, 10, minute, 10 minutes each or uh, something like that. And um, we unfortunately um, are, are missing our, our farmer uh, from Ireland who wasn't able to join us today, which is a pity. So in fact, down to five speakers, but we have a little bit more time uh, as a result. Um, if we think about nature-based solutions um, and climate challenge in the context of agriculture, it's, it's worth just bearing in mind before we get started, I think, think that most countries are beginning to realize the full import for agriculture and land use sectors of the net zero challenge. And it's been many years while we've been talking about the importance of, of climate change. Everyone's recognized that agriculture is not the easiest sector to address. Um, uh, it's a pretty vital activity. Uh, land use change isn't the the most rapid area of development. It's not like switching on or off a particular industrial process. It really does bring a lot of quite different sort of challenges, a lot of players that it's not one or two companies out there who need to change their ways. We're talking about pretty fundamental social and cultural changes as well as economic developments. Um, and it's interesting to note that emissions from agriculture were going down in, in, in the EU and Canada uh, particularly to the end of the last century into the beginning of this one, but trends have been less welcome, I think since around 9, 2010 or something like that in Canada, and not so different in the EU, where we see agricultural emissions pretty steady, if not rising. And so an awareness that to, to tackle the sector is going to be a non-trivial issue. And um, that means looking at not only agricultural practice, but associated land use. And when we talk about nature-based solutions, um, sometimes that encompasses a very wide range of options. It might mean uh, changes in, in non-agricultural land use in rural areas, forestry, wetlands, peatlands, ecosystem restoration. And it might be actually quite specific changes in agricultural practice and quite technical developments within the, in the production side. So it's a very wide spectrum of changes from um, tuning out the tractor uh, at one extreme from a pretty big and fundamental land use change on the other. And that, that is a challenge both for sort of policy makers, including this, people on this seminar, 
but also very much for farmers and landowners and, and their banks and lenders wondering, you know, what's, what's a viable business in this, in this future world? And, and it's been interesting looking at the kind of management changes which seem relevant in Canada and the EU, and a lot of them are very similar. And not surprisingly, um, including things like nutrient management, aspects of water management, looking at alternative energy use, vegetation on the farm, um, cover crops, different approaches to, to arable soils and, and, and so forth. So I think that although you one can see plenty of differences between Canada and the EU, and I think we'll hear about some of them from the speakers, uh, at the same time, a lot of the actual practical um, changes that are required and the and the kind of uh, encouragement that individual players might need are quite quite similar and and one issue will be whether the sort of ways that the europeans have got to encourage this kind of change um, are different from more or less successful from um, the kind of approaches which might um, be employed in canada and maybe we can learn a little bit from one one another so that's the sort of territory I hope we're going to dig into a little bit today. And um, um, I'd just like to then start by um, introducing our first speaker, um, who is um, uh, a specialist from the uh, Agriculture um, um, and Agri-Food Canada, the Federal Ministry, he's a special advisor uh, on climate and, and very well positioned to uh, lead us into this and he, um, um, he he's previously been involved in quite a lot of advisory work um, and leading policy on science and technology in, in agriculture in Canada and he started out um, uh, like our last speaker today at McGill University so we have some links here and so Javier would you like to kick us off from the Canadian side? Yes, thank you, David. Um, so um, I, I hope that I think we, we will have very specific questions, I think, as part of, of, of our engagement conversation uh, today. But first of all, thank you very much, I think, for uh, the organizers to have the opportunity uh, to have this dialogue. Uh, I know it's, it's part of a series of, of opportunities for, I think, the European Union and Canada to actually uh, talk about agriculture and where we are and where we are going, I think, on issues uh, such as, uh, I think, this uh, climate change. Um, I, uh, again, I think I, I look forward to some specific questions, but I just as, a, as an opening uh, comments, I, I just uh, want to reiterate uh, some of the things you mentioned in your opening remarks. Uh, so the GSG emissions uh, coming from the agriculture sector in Canada have been very stable for the, uh, I think the last uh, 10 or so years. Uh, so there is not a significant uh, increase necessarily um, in the, I would say, uh, the situation though, uh, I think as all of us are uh, looking at how can we reduce, get to a, a net zero type of situation, is a significant challenge. It is something, uh, as you mentioned, for the agriculture sector, uh, is, is, it presents several challenges and we can discuss a little bit more of that. But um, one of the things that also has happened, I think in the landscape in agriculture here in Canada is that, um, uh, some, some changes, for instance, on the uh, efficiency of how uh, livestock production is happening is something that uh, similar to the European Union. So we are seeing that our uh, herds, uh, whether it's cattle or dairy, etc., they are all getting sm they are getting smaller. Uh, the animal in general uh, is more efficient. And, and, and that, in a, in a way, is, is really good. It's something to be, uh, I think, uh, uh, seen as a, as a positive uh, trend. That said, one of the uh, important uh, sort of side effects, uh, if I can call it that, is um, there's a, a less demand for forages, uh, hay, et cetera, within the domestic uh, environment here in Canada. And with that, actually, so these plants that are uh, sequestering carbon in a much better and efficient way 
because they are actually more perennial type of crops, are being those lands switched into uh, annual crops. And with that, there's a disruption when you look actually at the entire landscape of what actually is happening. So reducing in one way, uh, it's likely the methane uh, production by ruminants, etc. But on the other hand, actually increasing because of the, the change on landscape uh, or, or the land use. So, so there are certain several of that kind of situations that are happening in Canada. Uh, uh, the agriculture sector for Canada is extremely important uh, uh, from the economic point of view. And, and I think uh, it is something also that is supporting, I think, uh, not only the exports uh, within Canada, but I think as we are actually sending a lot of that uh, to many parts of the world. So I will leave it at that as an opening sort of comments. Thank you very much. Um, that's really helpful. I mean, can you tell us a little bit more about what policy tools the Canadian government is, is using to try to help producers to um, develop their farming practices um, in, in the agriculture sector to address climate change? So, um... Uh, as a coincidence, I think um, our our uh, policy framework, our agriculture uh, agricultural policy framework in Canada, also is called CAP, uh, but it's the, called the Canadian Agricultural Partnership, and this is a partnership between uh, the federal government and provinces and territories. So every five years, uh, the um, uh, federal, provincial, and territorial governments uh, get together to discuss uh, this policy framework. We currently, the cap uh, that we currently have uh, is expiring in 2023. So we are in, 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 the, uh, in the onset of uh, the discussions for the next policy framework. Within this policy framework, um, we do have uh, a component uh, on, on what more broadly on the environmental side of things uh, that is looking at everything, uh, soil, water, biodiversity, but certainly as, as well on climate change. Um, on more recent times, um, what uh, in the last year, there's been several announcements uh, and initiatives that have been identified to specifically talk about climate change and, and the use of the nature-based climate solutions, which is uh, the topic, I think, of our discussion. So the nature-based climate solutions is, uh, there's a, a very significant, I would say, uh, I would call signature uh, initiative uh, of an investment uh, that is actually targeting the forestry sector, environment as a whole uh, and as well agriculture. So, and I'm mentioning this because there are components of that forestry element uh, that is actually touching on the agro uh, ecosystems. There is an element as well within the, what is a per, uh, purview of Environment and Climate Change Canada that actually look at wetlands and uh, those uh, uh, landscapes, grasslands, etc. that restoration and things that we are aiming for are something also that is happening in agroecosystems. So as a whole, these uh, nature-based climate solution activities of the government of Canada are, are certainly enhancing, I think, our, uh, our, our say as a policy tool, what we actually have to support the agriculture sector moving forward. Within that package, there is something specific that is called the agriculture climate solutions. That agriculture climate solutions um, has diff different facets uh, that, that are actually, um, and some of them are, are being right now sort of developed. One that has been pretty clearly uh, announced uh, and where we are moving forward with is something that um, in Canada about, about three years or so ago, we established something called living laboratories. These living laboratories, and, and I will mention actually for anybody from the European Commission that is here, uh, or France that we are working very closely with, uh, INRA Earth, that we are actually working in collaboration with uh, the Europeans already on, on, on this, uh, with some of you. So these living laboratories are something that we actually establish with the vision that when we are working on 
research areas uh, aim for uh, improving the environmental footprint of agriculture. These living laboratories is working side by side of scientists with uh, producers, uh, farmers, ranchers, etc., to actually be, be testing and, and implementing beneficial management practices on working landscapes. Right now, actually, with the four living laboratories that we have in Canada, and this has been a pretty innovative, I would say, policy tool that we are using, we have uh, approximately 3,500 uh, square kilometers that are covered. So I'm talking about large landscapes where we are implementing these beneficial management practices for actually improving our uh, mitigation, but as well adaptation and resilience towards climate change. So within that framework right now, we are expanding throughout a network of uh, the entire country. And we have this very large geography to deal with, um, where we have actually a significant um, uh, variability or, or diversity of landscapes and different production systems that are, that are in the area, so within, within Canada. So these um, agriculture climate solutions uh, that we are looking at is, is an important, I would say, policy tools that are within there. And we are exploring with additional resources that are recently announced as of April of this year. And I think my colleagues probably will speak to a little bit more about uh, more, I would say, the social or other um, innovative ways of, uh, of or, or policy tools that we can use, reverse auctions, uh, beneficial management practices, uh, insurance uh, schemes, etc., where we can actually start incentivizing, not necessarily only by payments or by using regulatory, which we also use, regulatory tools, but we also uh, want to incentivize the adoption, the accelerated adoption of these beneficial management practices to, I would say, uh, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, improve the uh, carbon sequestration in our soils and agricultural soils, improve the health of soils, as well as water and the biodiversity habitat within. Um, so I will, I will leave it at that, uh, on that, on that question, but there we are already using policy uh, tools that are working uh, in, in non-traditional ways. But I think we are looking forward to innovating even more with those other kinds of exploration of, of, of new policy tools. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks. Thanks very much. So those, those last things sound like, you know, innovative um, with ideas with, 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 some, with an incentive element. I just, just got time for one last quick question, which is perhaps you could tell us a tiny bit about the scientific integrated systems approach, which um, um, we hear is, is, is something that you, you, you're quite keen on, on promoting. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, David, for that question. Yes, um, I think this is something that um, um, I will tie it to this, to, to what I just mentioned about the living laboratories. One of the things that I think, um, uh, perhaps unfortunately, we have uh, uh, often taken approaches where we, I, I think, look at the, these landscapes, these agroecosystems in a more siloed way. <clears throat> and sometimes we, uh, I think, uh, we're trying to fix one problem, we end up displacing just the problem somewhere else. So. In these living laboratories and, and, and the approach that we, we are actually taking for our environmental type of um, research and approaches, I, I would say uh, at looking at how we are, we are sort of managing uh, our agroecosystems is to take a much more integrated systematic approach in, uh, in looking at that, at that environment so that we are sure that when we are actually uh, moving one lever on one side, that we are not actually affecting negatively something else. So when we, when we are establishing our research programming, when we are working in these living laboratories, we are uh, we're looking at, at the climate change element and the carbon sequestration opportunities and building that soil health, 
but actually we want to make sure that when we are working on one track that we are also working in, in similar sort of uh, in tandem with looking at uh, water quality and water quantity management, that we are looking at biodiversity elements associated with that, soil, uh, like micro, uh, microbial communities, but as well, uh, I think, uh, uh, larger macro species. Uh, so that's the approach that we are taking in looking at the environment as a whole. Um, so um, I'll leave it at that. Okay, that's that gives a very good introduction. Well, thank you very much, Javier. Now we're going to move on to the European side, if that if that's okay. And um, here we we're fortunate to have Mike Kenzi from DJ Agri. He is the environment coordinator in the in the policy perspectives unit um, of DJ Agri, which is quite an important part of the um, DJ Agri, I can say, in terms of going. Uh, and some of the innovative thinking, and um, he's been quite involved in the green architecture discussion of the around the cap, uh, which is um, one of the um, elements on the table at the moment being discussed with the, with the Parliament and and, um, uh, and the Council. And he he's previously been a speechwriter for Agriculture Commissioner uh, Fisher Bowl, and before that a journalist, and um, um, very very much. Is one of the people who can put across the the commission's thinking. So, um, Mike, uh, welcome to you. And um, I've got a couple of questions for you. Um, and um, the first one is really about um, how do nature-based solutions uh, on agricultural land feature in EU policies, and including the farm to fork strategy and um, now, how do we think we're going to advance these nature-based solutions in the EU? Thank you, David, and good morning or good afternoon to everyone, depending on, on where you are. Um, first of all, can I just say it's it's a nice change not to be using a PowerPoint presentation this afternoon, because I sometimes feel that people can get rather hypnotized by PowerPoints and then forget there's a speaker. Uh, the danger here, of course, is that I let my words hypnotize you instead. Um, but as I seem to have developed a cough in the last hour and a half, it could be that the cough breaks up my comments a little bit. So that could be quite helpful, but uh, we'll see. Um, so what's going on in the EU with regard to nature-based solutions, particularly with regard to climate change? And there I'll discuss both climate change mitigation and adaptation. And I think we have a focus on agricultural land this afternoon. Um, so as David says, we need to understand this within a context that in some ways is broadening out um, we have now a sort of umbrella strategy, if you like, put forward by uh, the Commission called the European Green Deal, uh, which in relation to it has various sort of sub strategies like the farm to fork strategy, the biodiversity strategy. Now, these set a broad framework of aspirations, things we're trying to do. They set targets or proposed targets in some cases, and they relate to various existing policy instruments and pieces of, of legislation. So they set quite a, a broad canvas, if you like. Um, but within that, if we're talking about nature based solutions on agricultural land, I think it's fair to say um, that the main policy tool for making things happen there is still um, the common agricultural policy. So or I will call it the cap, even though apparently, you know, that's a disputed term in, in, in terms of the meaning. So a little bit about what we have in the cap at the moment, knowing that there are negotiations on reform of the cap going on, which we hope will, will seem to come to, to a conclusion. So to put it very simply, the cap in the current period does make quite a lot of provision for nature-based solutions uh, for climate change, including in terms of what is mandatory, to use that term rather loosely, for farmers and what is voluntary. So in mandatory terms, if I can simplify things a little bit, if you are a farmer and you're getting income support payments through the cap or direct payments as we call them, there are certain basic things you have to do. And that includes things like maintaining a minimum soil cover, uh, maintaining a certain level of land management to, to limit soil erosion. Uh, very importantly, essentially keeping your permanent grassland, which is of course a very important uh, store of carbon. And then having a certain level of crop diversity on your arable land, which is of course very good for, for the soil and for also maintaining soil carbon if you, if you do it the right way, et cetera. 
And then on top of that, the CAP's so-called second pillar, so rural development policy, which member states basically program for themselves through rural development programs. Um, there are various kinds of support which farmers and others can get for relevant voluntary activity on top of that. So there's support for ongoing land management practices if they go beyond a farmer's basic obligations and entail extra costs or an income loss. So one of the most famous tools are at the moment, they're called agri-environment climate measures. They offer compensation for the costs and income losses involved so that the beneficial practices still make sense. Um, the CAP second pillar also offers support for physical investments, for training, for cooperation and for innovation. So that means that overall, in terms of what we give active financial support for, for voluntary activity, we can cover things like even better soil management. So, for example, for no tillage or for minimum tillage where that's appropriate. Um, also for more diverse and environmentally beneficial crop rotations compared to a farmer's basic obligation. So going beyond that, maybe use of crops requiring less water. Uh, we can potentially fund better pasture management, use of more diverse livestock breeds, including breeds which can cope better with climate change. Where it's environmentally appropriate, we could fund potentially things like rainwater harvesting where it's appropriate. Uh, two very important final examples of the kinds of thing we can do. We could fund re-wetting of peatlands, restoration of peatlands where they've been degraded. Of course, massive, massive stores of carbon, but some of which are reduce, uh, uh, releasing a lot of carbon. And then also we can fund tree planting on agricultural land, uh, for example, for, for setting up agroforestry systems. So that's a simplified picture of what we have available in the current period. <clears throat> Th thanks a lot, Mike. That, that brings it together really clearly. And could you give us an impression about the uptake of these measures in practice in the EU member states now? Of course, this is under the current cap still, but or, or, and also perhaps sort of challenges that they're facing and, you know, and therefore the ways in which you're seeking to change the policy to help address those challenges. So even the uptake side. So, of course, in terms of uptake, um, because the term nature based solutions is so broad, there are a lot of figures that, that one could quote, but I'll just give um, some selective examples here. So I've already mentioned the basic requirement on most farmers to have a certain level of <clears throat> crop diversity on their arable land. Now, the way things work out, that obligation in 2018 applied to 74% of the EU's arable land. And then results in practice, well, there I have to go back to figures from 2016. But in that year, 56% um, of farms under 10 hectares had at least three arable crops. Uh, for the size class of 10 to 30 hectares, it was 20% of farms. Um, for the size class over 30 hectares, it was 24% of farms. So that obligation, we think, did have a certain impact. But you can still see um, that in some areas and on some types of farm, the level of crop diversity is still lower than we would uh, like it to be. Um, if we move on to voluntary types of, of support, <clears throat> Let me give just a couple of examples here. Again, I'll talk about peatland and agroforestry. So for the current period with rural development policy, as I said, the second pillar of the cap, um, six member states have chosen to use their rural development funding uh, to support peatland restoration. But we still feel that overall protection of peatland is, is too low in the EU as a whole. And then if we look at agroforestry, um, it's seven countries from the EU of 27 member states that have programmed support for agroforestry through their current rural development programs. But actually implementation has been quite slow, uh, hopefully speeding up a little bit now. But the results are still um, behind where we want things to be. Now, what are the barriers to uptake then? Um, First of all, barriers to uptake just of practices, leaving behind the issue of cap support. So if farmers are thinking about new things, new practices, there is a natural reluctance, especially if no one around that farmer is already doing that in a given area. Will this new practice work? Uh, will it be profitable? How long will it take to work? Um, which is a quite understandable um, anxiety, if you like. And of course, even where benefits may be clear, it could be that they will come in a longer time frame, whereas costs will come quite um, upfront. And so in connection with that, for certain practices, which we might like to see introduced more widely, there can often be a lack of knowledge, lack of skills, lack of general support through advisory services for this potential new um, activity. If we move on to problems with uptake in the actual policy measures for the voluntary support, <clears throat> um, that can be related to a number of things. 
So first of all, in the current period, the budget for voluntary support is relatively limited, you might say, for a lot of member states. So they really have to eke out their money between quite a lot of things. Um, for that reason, others, sometimes for land management support payments, premia are set too low uh, to encourage farmers in. There can be other reasons for that. Um, member states simply choose to give relatively little prominence to some types of support, for example, for relevant training. Um, and then rules can be relatively complex or, or perceived as complex as well. Um, but we are trying to do things in response to that. So within the CAP reform proposal, which the Commission made, um, and which hopefully we're, we're reaching an agreement on, on now with the Council and, and, the, the, and the EU Parliament. Um, so first of all, with the general obligations in terms of what farmers have to do, uh, we're improving those. So we're seeking to introduce a much more explicit and general obligation to protect uh, peatlands and wetlands. Um, and then we've proposed an, what you could roughly call a new funding instrument called eco schemes. So this is a new category of environmental payment, which draws on the large direct payments budget. So the large income support budget, which is uh, in the cap. And EU member states in the parliament are discussing about how much should, should be spent on that as a minimum in future. And this will really be an opportunity for member states basically to spend a lot more money on specific environmental measures that they tailor to their requirements. And that could have a, a lot that's, uh, that's relevant to, to climate change in, in terms of nature-based solutions. Um, we're also trying to clarify certain rules where necessary. So for example, what happens when you include trees on farmland? Do you still get your, your income support payments, et cetera? Uh, we're creating closer links between how member states spend their cap money on the one hand and legislation on the environment and climate on the other hand. <clears throat> and then finally, um, in recommendations that the Commission made to member states last December about their future planning for spending uh, cap money, to quite a few member states actually we made recommendations about nature-based solutions which are very relevant to climate change. So again, I'll mention those two particular things, though there are more. We did talk to quite a few member states about peatland and about agroforestry, along with other things. So that's just a selection of what we've proposed to, to try to deal with problems. Uh, let's hope it all bears some fruit in the next few days. Thank, thanks a lot, Mike. We covered a lot of ground there, and <coughs> I hope we'll have time to come back in the, in the Q&A, so I, I can see there are already some people interested in, in what you've been saying about that. And interesting that member states are bringing up peatland and um, agroforestry, which have not been major figures in, in, um, in, in the cat world up to now, but it's certainly um, uh, very much left and center in the NDS debate. So if we can put you on hold for the minute, and now we're gonna move on, if we may, to um, our next speaker on the Canadian side, who is Karen Ross. And she is, on the one hand, a genuine farmer with land in the Laurentians, I believe, um, uh, in Quebec. Um, uh, but also she's a, um, the, the, the director of a, a very active 20,000 member um, farming uh, alliance, uh, looking to advance climate solutions in Canadian agriculture. And she's got a PhD originally from Western University on agrarian change. And, um, and she's, got experience of um, uh, working um, in advocacy and sort of policy analysis. So she's, she's more than a farmer. And um, certainly on the website, we can see a lot of uh, proposals for addressing the topic. So welcome, uh, Karen. Um, going to start off with a question for you is, how can farmers manage land differently um, in taking the opportunity of nature-based solutions in Canada? Thanks, David. Um, listen, I want to start off by saying that nature-based solutions are, are not one size fits all, and uh, Canadian agriculture is quite diverse from coast to coast to coast. Um, so I think maybe the best way for me to answer this question this morning is just to provide probably three examples of three different practices and how they're playing out on three different farms uh, within our network. So I'll focus in on a farm uh, in kind of central Canada where I am in the prairies and then out on the west coast. And I think what you'll hear across all of these examples is that these practices um, capitalize on natural ecosystem services that improve farm agronomy. So they make good sense for our farm businesses, but in turn, they're also improving the agri ecosystems in which we're working by offering multiple co-benefits like 
um, increase biodiversity, improve water quality, soil health, climate adaptation and mitigation, all the, all the great things that all of the speakers have mentioned so far. So to jump right in then, David, I, I'll, I'll start with cover cropping. And you actually mentioned it in your intro. So it sounds like it works both in Europe and in Canada. Um, you know, cover, cover crops here, we often call them service crops because while we don't directly harvest them uh, to draw income for our operations, they're planted to provide services uh, to both the farm and the ecosystem. And we often plant them after the cash crop is harvested to ensure that the soil is covered until snowfall and that we keep roots in the ground throughout the winter. Uh, so this practice kind of in general helps to increase carbon sequestration. It can build nitrogen for the following year if we integrate legumes into our mixes. Uh, it protects soil from erosion and degradation, and it often attracts a lot of biodiversity in terms of pollinators and beneficial in insects. So Brent, who's one of our network's lead farmers, I would say, is based in Ontario, and he has a fairly intensive vegetable operation. And we call him the cover crop king because he's been cover cropping for the past 15 years on his vegetable operation. And 15 years ago, at least in Canada, cover cropping was a very, very, very marginal practice, uh, almost not adopted. And he started growing them because he needed uh, more soil fertility. And 15 years later, uh, because of this practice, what has happened is that they've very significantly reduce the purchase of inputs. So they, they purchase very, very few inputs now on an annual basis on their vegetable operation. They have far less weeds and better germination of their vegetables. And what's, what's kind of the, the cool part of this story is that they're actually now marketing their veggies as climate friendly. Uh, and the folks who are buying them, uh, it's typically direct sales to restaurants and wholesale. Uh, see them as higher quality and that they taste better. So they're actually getting an additional reward as a result of not just cover cropping, but other kinds of practices on their farm. So then maybe I'll move on to uh, rotational grazing of livestock. So I, I think probably everybody who's listening knows a little bit about rotational grazing, but just quickly it involves kind of moving livestock across paddocks so that in, in sequence, uh, so that the grass ecosystem can restore, it has time to recover and sequester carbon in between grazing. And, you know, in Canada, both tame and natural pastures have huge ecosystem benefits, but the thing is, is that they're at risk of degradation and conversion from encroaching annual cropland. Uh, conversion to annual cropland results in significant emissions and development, so, you know, urban development, uh, more suburbs. So uh, tons of benefits in terms of protecting those ecosystems, in terms of integrating uh, livestock into them. Uh, but I, I'd like to just share kind of a fascinating story from our network from the West Coast, actually, uh, from a farmer named Shanti. Uh, she purchased a piece of land out in BC, British Columbia, and it was cleared, deforested, and significantly degraded. And so she moved her animals, her livestock, to graze on the parcel of land in order to improve its quality and her herd health. And she was moving them very frequently, every 24 to 48 hours. So that's kind of a very intensive uh, way of uh, grazing. And um, on the West Coast, forest fires are becoming much more common now because of climate change. And uh, three years ago now, a big, big forest fire passed through her area. Uh, out on the coast of BC. And I mean, I wish I could share images with you today, but they really say it all. I mean, the grazing landscape that she was managing was completely protected from the forest fire as a result of the soil moisture and ecosystem health that had built up. And you can see right down the fence line, you know, on the side that she was managing, it's green and vibrant. And on the side, where she wasn't managing with livestock, it's burnt and black to ashes. So integrating animals in the ecosystem, you know, not only made sense for her business, but also made really great sense in terms of climate adaptation and resilience. And David, maybe just, just really quick to end on this one. Um, the two farms that I just mentioned were smaller farms in the Canadian context, but hearing Mike speak, I'm realizing they're probably reasonably big in, in the European context. They were both kind of under 100 acres, but um, something that is really important to think about in Canada in terms of nature-based solution focuses on uh, 
nutrient management and specifically nitrogen fertilizer management. So we have very, very large farms in Canada. And this last example is from, you know, a farmer named Ian out in the prairies. He, he runs a 3000 acre uh, grain operation. And uh, I'll just start by saying that nitrogen fertilizers are the single largest growing source of emissions in our sector in Canada. So it's really the elephant in the room. You know, if we can't, if we can't tackle nitrogen, uh, it's going to be tough to, to change the direction of our emissions curve. And nitrogen fertilizers are often applied without kind of a complete understanding of the nitrogen balance of the ecosystem. So if we can understand the nitrogen that's available in the soil, it allows farmers to take advantage of what the soil has built up and made available for plants so that we can avoid over applying fertilizers. Um, so it's essentially using the soil ecosystem in order to be more efficient, which in many ways can be better for the farmer's bottom line, but certainly it's better in terms of emissions. And the farmer Ian that I'm referring to, just quickly to wrap this up, you know, through his work, uh, intense analysis of the nitrogen balance in his system, he's been able to reduce uh, his nitrogen fertilizer use on many of his fields in most years by about 30% and achieve the same, if not higher yields than most of his neighbors. So another good story of success. Thank you very much. That's, that's a really good range of different um, farming situations. Um, and I was going to ask you next about the uptake. And uh, I know you've been advocating for more money for um, encouraging farmers to adopt good practice. Um, how does the 2021 budget um, um, affect things, do you think, in Canada, of course? Yeah, it, it, thanks, David. It's a, it's a good question. So uh, Mike summarized it really well, actually, you know, when he said that farmers face a lot of barriers in terms of adopting new practices. And the thing is, is that, you know, I focused it on a few farmers who are innovating, uh, adopting nature-based solutions, and we're seeing them more and more adopted in Canada, but really they're not adopted at scale across millions of acres yet. So you know, as Mike said it well, you know, we take on risks and often there's upfront costs. So there's a significant financial barrier. Um, our economic analysis shows that, you know, in many times, kind of if we're going to generalize these kinds of practices do end up being either economically beneficial or neutral to the operation if they're adopted for several years but that doesn't change the fact that there's a need for investment and change in management up front and then you know there's also knowledge barriers so knowing how to implement these practices well uh, and with success and then and social barriers I would say in terms of you know feeling supported within our communities to try something new and different you know a cover cropped field can look quite messy <laughs> from the rural highway so uh, what we saw in the federal budget was uh, a new 260 million dollars that will directly support uh, farmers to adopt the kinds of practices that I was talking about so cover cropping uh, rotational grazing um, improve nitrogen management and protection of wetlands and trees on farms. And these are programs and priorities that FCS, Farmers for Climate Solutions, has been uh, recommending for, for about the past year now. So really, we're, we're, we're thrilled that it's now announced in the budget, because for us, what these programs uh, will allow for is some support to overcome the knowledge, financial, and kind of community or social barriers that we're facing in terms of scaling up these practices across millions of acres. Um, also, you know, as Javier mentioned, our egg policy in Canada is delivered through, predominantly delivered through these big frameworks, five-year frameworks. And our next one is coming up in 2023. And it's our view that, you know, we only have nine growing seasons left to the Paris Agreement to significantly reduce emissions in Canada. And it's our view too that farmers want to be part of that solution, but our emissions are currently projected to not go in the right direction to support Canada towards achieving our commitments to Paris. So the idea of getting kind of an infusion of new investment to directly support farmers to take on these practices allows us to kind of jumpstart emission reductions this year so that then we can start to scale up that potential Kind of changing the conversation in rural communities about what's possible. Um, you know, farmers look over the fence post to see what others are doing. And this kind of new investment will hopefully change that conversation and kind of change the, the spirit in our sector so that we can really 
prioritize uh, nature-based solutions, climate mitigation in our next major policy framework, uh, up, currently up for negotiation, but to be launched in 2023. So that's an encouraging picture. Um, <laughs> and just finally and briefly is, yeah. are there other things apart from sort of financial support, which you think could be deployed to help uptake, whether on, you know, by, by government or by the, the industry or, or you know, sort of by farming communities and, and your own organization? Yeah, great question, David. There, there is so much more than just financial support. I think a lot of it can be delivered through good public policy, but I'll just, I'll just maybe flag two, two or three key things here. Um, to address the community barrier, you know, this social barrier around how much really like guts, how much courage it takes as a farmer to take on something new on our, on our lands. You know, our livelihoods are based on how we manage our land and we count on good harvests to draw in money. So uh, what, what we're really inspired by at Farmers for Climate Solutions are these early innovators, right? The early adopters who have already taken on nature-based solutions on our lands with a fair bit of success. I think there's an important role for kind of showcasing their leadership and um, uh, kind of celebrating what they've done to chart a new path for the sector. Uh, we're, we don't have much kind of formalized farmer to farmer community, farmer to farmer communications in Canada. A lot of it happens at, at the Tim Hortons, down the, coffee, the local coffee shop down the street. Uh, some of it happens literally over fence lines, but I think kind of more organization around farmer to farmer sharing um, so that those who have had success implementing these practices can help to build the confidence in others and neighbors and communities beyond that you know it's possible to do something different to address the climate crisis while also um, maintaining a good operation and then maybe just the second one I'd flag is this knowledge barrier you know we need a lot more agri-environmental agronomy services for farmers in Canada. And I think uh, there's, a, there's a serious need to develop a country-wide agri-environmental agronomy service structure, because what we see is that, you know, if you're in a community in which these services exist, you can take advantage, but, but it's quite piecemeal still across the country. So farmers aren't getting the access that we need to better understand how to implement these practices with success on our farm. Maybe I'll leave it at that for time, David. Thank, thank you so much. That was really interesting. And I think it chimes with a lot of, unfortunately we haven't got a, a farmer from the European Union, but I have done quite a few farmer interviews in the last few years and, and very similar messages come up, including, as you say, about financial support, including around the issue of, of leadership and, and and having the nerve to go out and doing something outside your community and and getting the support and the information it's quite a knowledge intensive set of changes to make and, and some farmers I've, I've talked to have, have very much emphasized the importance of measurement and having sort of carbon tools and maybe we can come back to that in the chat whether that's a helpful way of actually trying to get metrics embodied into farm management um, in, in a new way and whether that's a useful thing um, for the moment though, we just say thank you very much and going to move to our next uh, speaker. And we're, and we're going from practitioners to, to the experts standing back and, and taking a, a, an independent view of what's going on. And um, our next speaker is Alphonse Versing, a professor of agriculture economics, the Department of Food, Agriculture and Resource Economics at the University of Guelph. And he has um, had uh, many years of experience looking at technological innovation and its impact and, and um, um, being um, uh, working on, on different aspects of technology, um, including now uh, the, the climate change ones. So uh, welcome to Alphonse. Thank you, David. Um, good, so my first question to you, if I, if if I may, is what do you, we've heard a little bit about how farmers and government think about policy tools. What, what, what's your perspective on the most successful policy tools used in Canada in, to incentivize farmers to um, adopt the right practices in this context? Well, the most successful ones are probably the ones that are used. Uh, you know, they're the ones that have sort of stood the test of time. And, uh, and 
I think I can categorize them into three. One would be educational programs, and those are the type that uh, increase, increase awareness uh, about the environmental impacts that uh, farmer practices have. And as Karen has noted, as Mike and uh, and Julio with the uh, or Jave, sorry, with the uh, the living labs, which is an exercise to demonstrate the the impact of uh, of practices on uh, on um, the the whole agro ecosystem. So that they're fairly common. They're not maybe uh, they they maybe not as common as they should be, um, given you know Karen's last comment. But they're they're relative. They fit in well with uh, other extension sort of farm management programs. Uh, the other would be design-based programs, and those focuses on practices and and whether it be rotational grazing or cover crops or uh, restoration of peatland, they are focused on practices. Uh, in contrast, performance-based measures focus on emissions. They focus on uh, nitrous oxide, they focus on the level of carbon sequestered, they focus on the amount of phosphates emitted. And we don't have those types of programs uh, very often in agriculture because they're costly to implement and measure. You know, just to your last point there, David, and I think we'll, we'll come back to that. You know, if we were able to monitor and measure the, the amount of carbon sequestered or the amount of nitrous oxide emitted, by each individual farm, I think it would change the type of policy we have, and it would change the, the practices by farmers, their, their interest in getting involved. So instead, we have programs that focused on, on practices, and typically, they are either command and control, you cannot do this, or they provide some sort of cost share program, and we've heard a number of, of those uh, examples provided. And in Canada, they have been the most most widely used. So you get 50% of the cost of building a manure storage. You get 50% of the cost of building a buffer strip, for example, or you get $40 per acre to, uh, have, uh, to plant cover crops. So those are fairly widely used and they typically are a share of the, uh, of the, the cost rather than a hundred and they're available to a pretty wide set of farmers. Um, in contrast to paying 100% of the cost for certain practices to certain farmers. Um, the other approach is that we prevent people. Uh, you cannot build uh, a pig barn near a, uh, near a stream. Uh, your pig barn has to have enough manure storage uh, to, for a complete year so that you do not spread manure during the winter time. Um, so those sorts of restrictions, we see when we want to, we, this is the farmers currently here and we wanna prevent them from going backwards, okay? We don't want them to have in, in, in uh, yeah, go backwards and you know, their environmental impact is worse. So we're preventing them from going backwards and so we see these direct regulations and it might be you know other examples we we ban certain pesticides okay that that's uh, we don't want that to happen the cost share programs are incentivized trying to get them to do better okay and uh, and typically that's what we have in place direct controls to prevent going backwards cost share programs to go forward so so those are kind of the major categories where i think they're most successful are where they are targeted you know, if they've got a specific goal in mind. And in this area, I can think of uh, one where it was focused on phosphates into a grand, into the Grand River, a particular river that, per, that is a source of uh, water for the community. And they wanted to reduce the phosphate levels. So it's very targeted on certain farmers with certain practices and it did its job. Uh, and I think whenever you can target uh, the program uh, in terms of the practice, in terms of the environmental objective, uh, then you are more likely to be successful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that gave us a very good overview. And I think you sort of gave us an impression of the diversity of measures that used in Canada. Um, 
I mean, just in terms of success as measured by outcome, and you mentioned, I think, very similar experience in Canada to the EU that we're, we're paying basically for practices and we hope they're good proxies for right. actual right. outcomes. You know, I think, I think we're all kind of used to... Do you think in terms of actually gaining the outcomes we're ultimately interested in, the, the particular measures you, you'd point to as successful, or maybe we could learn from the EU, or and if you want to venture an, an, an opinion about, um, um, you know, what what which are more interesting approaches on, on in either side of the um, of the Atlantic here, that 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 would be interesting, and then perhaps we do need to measure more if we're going to get. Yeah, yeah I, I think you know we, we talk about technology um, at the um, at the farm level and how it's changed and the types of practices, the types of yeah technology that we we'd like farmers to um, adopt. I think uh, I think technology plays a role in what might be the future. Uh, uh, and if we look at um, it's really a digital agriculture, right? The digitalization of policy as well as what's happening on the farm. So precision agriculture on the farm allows farmers to, um, to uh, modify their practices for certain aspects in the field rather than a uniform rate across the whole field, okay? So, and because technology in the past has, has encouraged this economies of size, that's been the most profitable way of, uh, of handling it. So precision agriculture allows us to recognize the heterogeneity in the field and maybe apply more fertilizer in certain spots, less fertilizer in others, as an example. I think that this sort of same technology allows us to capture more information um, on individual farmers' practices. And so we can, we can target those practices more explicitly. Um, but eventually it might also allow us to, uh, to monitor emissions and that changes the type of policy from a design base to a performance base. And I also think that it allows farmers to see that there's a target that they want to reach. Okay, on the, on, it, it's very difficult right now. If you tell a farmer uh, you should adopt, uh, you should reduce your fertilizer rate because you're gonna reduce nitrous oxide emissions. They can't see that, you know, why me, you know, um, I'm concerned about, I want a good looking crop and I want it profitable. Okay? And, uh, and I know if I apply more nitrogen, I'm going to see a green crop. If I apply less nitrogen, I might not see that green crop and I can't see the benefits from that. So if, if there were the technology improves so that we could measure those emissions, then I think we would have a change in the type of policy and the likelihood of uptake of, uh, of practices that would reduce those emissions. And, and do you think that applies to soil carbon as well? Do you think farmers would uh, invest in building soil carbon if they could? I mean, we do have some measures available in Europe and, and it'll be interesting, our next speaker, Anna, is Germany has a lot of work on this and trying to measure soil carbon changes and whether they're reliable and whether they're permanent and, and so forth. Um, you've got a lot of arable soil in Canada. Um, um, what's the potential there, do you think? I think, yeah, no, this is one where they think it's definitely think it's a win-win, uh, you know, where it could, and because I think soil carbon um, is closely related to soil health and there's a, an increasing awareness of farmers on the importance of improving their soil health with regards to not only higher yields over time, but I think the resiliency. I think there's a, if, I think over the last decade, there has been an acceptance of climate change or at least variability in yields, whether, whatever it's the reason for, through in the farm sector. And so how can they build greater resiliency and having more complex rotations uh, and including cover crops is one of the ways of dealing with that. However, let me just interject with a, you know, one of the, the problems with that is what happens with crop prices. <laughs> So farmers, so in Southern Ontario here, a typical rotation is corn, soybeans, and wheat, perhaps. If a farmer plants wheat, they plant a cover crop. Okay. What has happened to wheat uh, acreage this year? It's gone way down because corn and soybean prices have gone way up. 
and uh, and so as a result, it's not that they that their interest in cover crops is gone. It's that their interest in planting wheat has gone. They've gone to a more simplified rotation because prices have just gone crazy, and uh, and now we're planting less less cover, wheat and as sub, as consequence less uh, cover crops. Actually, that's a really interesting example that, of how the, uh, how the market dynamics interact with the agri-environment dynamics. And I'm going to ask you one unscripted, very quick question. Have you mentioned that you were thinking about reverse auctions in Canada? Has that actually happened? That, that that's talked about in Europe. We don't tend to do it. There have been some um, examples of it, uh, and uh, it has been used more widely in Australia and uh, and more for uh, practices that convert uh, farmland back to its natural habitat and uh, and you know limited success or limited uh, pilots here but I think there's growing interest in it okay well thank you very much that was extremely interesting and I hope we'll pick up a couple of those points in the chat and now we're going to move back to Europe, if that's okay. Uh, thank you. And um, our, last, um, our last speaker is Anna Freire Larsen um, from the Ecologic Institute in, in Berlin, and where she's a senior fellow. And Ecologic's a, a think tank doing very similar work to IEP, and she does academic work and, and consultancy work for the European Commission and other things. And, and amongst other things, she was the um, co-author of a rather interesting project um, uh, financed by DG Klima from the European Commission on operationalizing EU carbon farming initiative um, uh, and that generated quite a lot of interest and she might she might pick that up um, and she's originally from Slovenia but um, did her undergraduate uh, course in, in McGill so she's got an idea of what Canada is like too so um, welcome Anna um, have I got you there? Yes, thank you. Hi, David. Hi, everyone. Hi. Nice to see you. Um, this is a very big question I got. <laughs> give us a sort of one minute overview of, of soils in Europe at the moment in terms of, of, of our subject today and what sort of risks we're helping and what we're facing. And, um, you know, can we can initiatives under Nature Based Solution help? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so soils in Europe show really worrying rates of degradation. According to data by the European Environment Agency, uh, we know that 60 to 70 percent of soils in Europe are in an unhealthy state. And the costs associated with this um, level of degradation exceed 50 billion euros annually in Europe. So it gives you a sense of how big of, the prob of a problem we have in Europe. And the main threats to soil health come from uh, water wind erosion, from contamination from agrochemicals and industrial sources. We have quite significant historical pollution um, in Europe, but also from loss of soil carbon stocks. And these trends, we can see them across Europe. And then more locally, regionally, we have significant problems with desertification and salinization in the Mediterranean areas, um, and also um, soil compaction and subsoil compaction, for example, in Denmark, parts of northern Germany, and um, in peri-urban areas around cities, soil sealing and loss of agricultural land, um, especially very fertile agricultural land, is highly problematic. And this is, of course, worrying because when soils are polluted and degraded they can't deliver their ecosystem functions and when we talk about climate of course the soil carbon function is central um, but also maintaining productivity and ability to buffer against impacts such as flooding and droughts and um, we often focus just on agricultural drivers but we have to keep in mind that the industrial pollution and soil sealing are really significant within the European context and um, nature-based solutions, of course, are central. They're cornerstone, and we've heard many examples. Um, they're cornerstones for maintaining soil health. Uh, we can't have good soil management without nature-based solutions and working with agroecological processes um, in agricultural systems. And people have named a lot of different examples. Maybe I just add one that hadn't been mentioned that is a little bit, um, perhaps a bit more exotic, is deep 
rooting crops such as alpha alpha when we're dealing with subsoil compaction um, remediation by mechanical um, measures can be destructive but if you remediate with deep rooting crops it can really return some of that functioning and um, also increases deep carbon sinks that are less susceptible to reversibility so um, yeah, science shows clearly NBS um, are central for soil health in Europe, but implementation lags behind. Um, and there we talked about CAP and we talked about education, but perhaps what we haven't talked about is food wider food system changes in the supply chain itself on the input upstream, you know, breeding, um, breeding activities, research on genetic aspects of crops um, and downstream things like creating stable outlets um, through um, good processing for minor crops not just wheat, maize, rapeseed, but for crops such as linseed, hemp, um, things that really increase the crop diversity at farm level, but may not have a market outlet, just to broaden that view a little bit. Yeah. No, thank you. That, that gives us a really very clear overview um, and, and signals some, some issues right across the spectrum. Um, if we just pick up the project you were involved in, this carbon mm -hmm. farming project for a minute. Um, would you just be able to give us a little bit of an idea of, of what came out of that and, and what, what, how that points to the future? Yeah, so the carbon farming study, um, it was a two year project uh, that we did together with IEP and Kovi from, from Denmark. And um, our aim was to develop guidance for setting up result based payment schemes. So these could be uh, through agri environment payments or also voluntary carbon credit payments. And uh, we looked at the different challenges in, um, in setting up these payments and effectiveness of existing um, certification schemes and then developed design options or sort of step-by-step -step guidance for um, people thinking of setting these up for, we looked at, uh, well, identify that peatland rewetting and agroforestry have the highest potential per hectare um, in, um, in the European context and also the feasibility of setting up result-based payments for these is quite promising. Whereas for um, maintaining and increasing soil carbon and mineral soils, there's um, a lot more challenges, both in terms of measurement and in terms of the total potential, mitigation potential. So what's interesting, though, is that most of the bottom-up initiatives that are emerging in, in Europe actually are focusing on soil carbon on mineral soil. So there's a bit of a disconnect and some homework, I think, for us to, to um, create more incentives uh, for peatland rewetting and for agroforestry setups. Yeah, and maybe one uh, another point to mention here is that we talked about performance orientation of policies a lot, and you know, result-based payments are sometimes hailed as the silver bullet, but our study points to really that there's it, this really requires high investments in monitoring, reporting, and verification, brings along with it very significant challenges on that side, but also brings along quite significant risks for farmers. Um, and when we look at biodiversity pay result based payments and your colleagues have done quite a bit of work on this in Europe, um, there's the uptake isn't as high as we would like. So we need to be careful with result based payments for carbon um, to really think carefully, yeah, where where do they make sense um, and to have a lot of piloting and testing before we try um, scaling them up uh, very broadly. And I think the European Commission is doing a good job in uh, funding some of these pilots uh, through DG Climate and through the LIFE program. So yeah, but quite a bit of work to be done and um, yeah, caution in terms of how these are used. Do you, thank you, and do you feel that the proxies we're using in terms of management payments, um, like re-wedding of peatland, you know, for example, um, um, do you think we're going the right direction? Do, do you think we're learning to um, promote the right practices, the, the 
choose the right proxies, monitor them enough so we know, because taking on board your point about the challenges of pure results-based payments in this mm -hmm. sector. Um, so I think that the, no, we're not doing enough. I think the CAP doesn't have enough monitoring in place. Uh, we've looked, I, I've been involved with assessments, evaluations of CAP in Germany, implementation, and for example, in Baden-Württemberg, the federal state in southwest of Germany, most of the monitoring that they're really doing on, on specific CAP measures and their effectiveness, and even in the design of these measures, comes from their federal funds. And of course, there's a, there's, you know, this, there's a cost component to this. Not all member states and not all federal states have the, co the capacity to fund this kind of monitoring. So I think we need to do a bit more thinking of how we, how we involve research and piloting projects in the design of these agri-environment payments. The design, in the design phase, we really need to think, um, you know, how do you define, what kind of a crop rotation will give you the impact in a specific location? What kind of, um, if you're setting up requirements for mulching, what is the mulching rate that you need? Uh, is it 20%? Is it 30%? And um, you need a lot more applied research and publicly funded research to do that. And that's a concerning um, trend that we see within the European Union, I think, is that this publicly funded basic agronomic research is often not um, sufficiently funded and available. But I think that, that yeah, as a, as a proxy, if you have the research to back it up in the design phase, I think can be very effective and in the end, less, uh, less cumbersome and less costly. Okay. Um, and sort of just finally, are there other forms or other sort of nature-based solutions you'd like to mention? You, you emphasize interest in the agroforestry and, and, and peat restoration, especially in agroforestry uptake in the EU is very low, uh, as far as I know, mm -hmm. um, quite seen as quite a big change by most farmers and quite a strange thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, are, are there other, are there other, other sort of ways of, of advancing that you, you'd just like to pick up you think would be particularly promising? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, in in, term, in relation to water management, uh, river restoration, um, establishing the natural hydromorphology of rivers, I think can be extremely important and useful. And um, other water retention measures, such as restoring floodplains, um, um, can be very, yeah, very effective. And then outside of the agricultural context in urban areas as well, I mean, we can also have urban gardening, urban, um, you know, green infrastructure that on the one hand brings in biodiversity, addresses the heat island impact, but also has very positive impact on health and well-being of, of city dwellers. So those, um, yeah, just thinking a bit broadly outside of the agriculture those would be my suggestions. Well, thank you very much. You've really given us a good overview there. So if, if we, all the speakers could, could um, stay available for a moment, I think what we'll do is see what we've got in the Q&A. And just to encourage anyone who wants to, to put the, use the um, raise hand function to do so. Um, but I'll just pick, pick out a couple of, um, um, Things that have come up in the in the Q and A already, um, and there's one I think which is for Mike about cap subsidies being based on land area rather than on practices and supporting larger um, um, producers um, rather than encouraging change and and saying does the EU plan to shift the cap towards a less productivist model? I don't know if you have any responses to that. Uh, I might have one or two. <laughs> um, is the cap a productivist model? Look, I mean, the cap, I'll, I'll take that point first. I mean, the cap has changed enormously. I mean, if we go back to the 70s, the 80s, yes, the cap was productivist. I mean, it worked primarily on the basis of guaranteed high domestic prices, which encouraged production on a huge scale. We had large surpluses, which we exported with the help of exports. So, uh, export subsidies, that was productivism. I mean, it's really changed a great deal since then. Payments, uh, income support payments were essentially decoupled from uh, production, et cetera. You don't have to produce to get them. You don't have to produce anything in particular. Uh, so I think we've really moved a long way from productivism. 
And we don't have the surpluses that we used to have. We have some small cyclical surpluses from time to time, completely different picture from before. But the way the payments are made, if we talk about land management payments, as opposed to, for example, support for investments, etc., cetera, um, they are tied to land, but they're tied to land with even environmental conditions in the case of income support. And then for the specific environmental payments, they are tied to practices as well. But of course, you have a situation where the land distribution between farms is, is rather uneven in many parts of the EU. Uh, you have a relatively small proportion of farmers you know, owning a lot of the land. So of course, in the way the subsidies are paid, um, that, that makes a difference. But what I would say is that for the future, I mean, already we've been encouraging member states to try to do a certain redistribution of payments where it's appropriate. And um, for the future with what we've proposed for the cap, um, we're doing that even more, where all parts of the cap, most of them anyway, will be planned together on a given member state's territory. So the income support at the same time as specific environmental payments, all the rest of it. And the idea is to make sure that all of those payments are targeted as well as possible to the range of objectives for the policy, so environmental objectives and economic. Now, where that means it would be appropriate to have a certain redistribution towards smaller farmers, for example, we would want to see member states doing that, but also then in the balance between, say, income support payments and specific environmental payments. So I've already said we will have this new funding instrument, I call it for the future, the eco schemes, which draw on the direct payments budget. That is already a very, very significant change. And as I said, um, EU member states and the European Parliament are discussing what the minimum level of spending on those eco schemes should be per member state, but that will already make a significant change. So I think um, in terms of better targeting of payments, in terms of size of farms, but types of payments and actually achieving something, we're proposing quite big steps forward. It will depend to a large extent on how um, determined and intelligent member states are with using the possibilities that you know we the commission will be behind them encouraging them pushing them and when member states come forward with their plans for how they'll spend their future cap funds uh, we will be approving those plans so i hope very much that that will uh, bring about further progress uh, in these areas thanks okay well, thank you i won't ask you um when, when we'll be getting to that stage in the process um but um that that takes us along thank you very much and now the, the next question is from alessandro tucci about will the next generation package of aid finance the transition to um uh, nature-based solutions for agriculture anyone like to pick that up next generation package of aid I'm, I'm not sure what the next, but I'm not sure if that was in, in the EU or in, in, in Canada. Um, maybe that, it was both. That's the, uh, I mean, that, I, I think we're talking about the EU there, or at least I, I'm, I'm aware of a version of that. I mean, a short answer from my side is I wouldn't say a great deal about that, but, but in essence, yes, there are possibilities to, to use this for agriculture and potentially for nature-based solutions. This is the rural development extension package. You could essentially phrase it in those terms, yeah. yes. Okay. okay. Um, so we're, we're not ruling out. Um, um, uh, Javier has his hand up. Do you want to jump in now? Well, I, I just wanted to mention, uh, because I'm pretty sure that the question was for the European uh, uh, colleagues, not for Canada, but uh, just, just to mention that I think the current um, certainly uh, thinking in every direction that we are looking at in Canada, I think the next policy framework the, the, uh, that we are thinking for uh, after uh, 2023 certainly is looking at the environment and, and uh, these nature-based uh, climate solutions as a, as a critical component of, I think, our strategy towards addressing the issues of climate change. So just wanted to say that uh, I think the, the current thinking in Canada is very much gearing uh, in that direction. I would like to make other comments later, but uh, I think uh, let's go through the questions. Um, and then there's a specific comment here from Ryan Barrett about the uh, incentivizing forage crops as, and using organic wastes uh, better is through community-based or regional biodigesters. Um, providing a, um, uh, a product which you can put back in the soil as well as obviously as 
as gas. I, does anyone want to comment on that as a as a mitigation system, uh, Anna? Because yeah, so there. I would I would hear issue a word of caution about biogas digesters because what we see. Um, is in at least here in the Bavarian context um, is that the feedstock is extremely important in terms of the impact it has on soil health. So if you're using municipal compost, the quality of that compost um, can be quite problematic in terms of microplastics and other pollutants. And in terms of also what the farmers feed um, the biogas, uh, yeah, it, it, it just, it can be a source of pollutants on the farm. So um, there's no easy answer to this. I mean, some people propose that you could have uh, good quality, um, good quality standards and enforcement, but that's very complex and very um, difficult to enforce actually. So um, it, this might come down to very regional initiatives where the trust component is uh, what guarantees kind of the good outcome for soil health. But yeah, I think that there's a way to go before we can use these municipal sources of organic waste um, in kind of a circular fashion. Thank you. And, and there's a question here I'm gonna to put to Karen, which is really saying that after you know, some decades of consolidation and um, mechanization and agriculture increasing scale, um, are we now talking about going down to a more community focused set of structures and um, and how, how does one help farmers who, who want to um, move away from a conventional structure and I think you have a bit of experience with this. Um, yeah maybe I can David I'd also love to just jump in on what Anna was just saying on the last question in Canada one of our biggest kind of hottest topics these days is around the price on pollution Price on pollution is Canada's most significant policy to reduce emissions, and it's impacting grain farmers in Canada because they dry grain with fuels that uh, are, are with, with fossil fuels uh, that have the price on pollution applied to them. There's this made in Canada technology recently came out, an innovation in Manitoba that uses biofuels produced on farms or to uh, dry the grain. So it's an opportunity to move away from more traditional fuels like natural gas and propane. I, just like Anna, I, I'd like to, I think this is an interesting innovation. I'd just like to say that um, I think there's, there's a need for more work around kind of life cycle assessments, whether or not that leads to um, kind of complete uh, emissions reductions compared to propane and natural gas. So thanks, David, <laughs> because I got volunteered, I wanted to jump in there. Um, on the next question, it's a, it's a very interesting question. What we're seeing in our network is actually a fair bit of diversification, even on some of those very large scale farms in the prairies that we're working with. So um, this opportunity is predominantly coming out of the market, I would say, actually. I think that's predominantly what's changing it is, you know, good prices for things like pasture pork or pasture poultry and integ integrating that into grain operations is just one example in which farms are diversifying. I don't think that's changing the overall kind of land mass or scale of the farm, but it's certainly providing for more diverse rotations and more integrated systems of, of grain and livestock, which of course has tons of environmental benefits. Um, I like what Mike was saying in Europe around cross compliance and a certain uh, um, standard for on-farm diversity. Cross compliance is not well used and it's not really used in Canada. In the province that I'm in, in Quebec, it's quite substantially used, but at a national level, not so much. I, I think from a policy perspective, that'd be interesting to consider. I, I don't know how, how I, I, I think it would be hotly debated in the farm community as to whether or not this was an appropriate policy direction for Canada, but I think that kind of policy could lead to significant changes on uh, in diversity at the farm level. A final point maybe I'd make is, is draws back on Alphonse's point. Um, you know, canola prices are also super high this year in Canada. And so we're seeing huge increases in canola, canola uh, 
being quite high emission. So um, I, I'd, I'd like to think more about how market-based changes are important in terms of encouraging environmental stewardship on land, uh, because of course, as, as business people, farmers are first and foremost motivated by what the market price offers. That's a good point. Thank you so much. We're running out of time, but if there's, there's sort of 30 seconds left for everybody, leaving me 30 seconds to close down, just to ref reflect and have a, and if you want to mention things to cooperate on between EU and Canada do, but any reflection back? Yeah, no, I, I would try to, to, to be brief and, and wrap up that. But I think uh, I think uh, I was going to mention, in fact, the, the example that Karen just mentioned about the canola prices as per Alphonse uh, uh, comment. But I probably my last thought on that, based on everything I actually heard, I think, um, and especially when Anna mentioned about the monetary capacity and the European Commission and, and whatever we have in Canada, notwithstanding the good news, I think that Karen said about the these uh, monies uh, identified in the last budget um, for Canada, there is, I believe, not enough money really in Canada or anywhere else, but I will certainly say for Canada that we can put to pay our way out of what we actually want to achieve. I think there is, uh, it, there's not to underestimate, I think those, those elements um, that, that we have in place right now, uh, the funding that we have, but I think um, we need to actually uh, look at what are those elements that are challenging for uh, farmers to adopt practices uh, to lead us to the kinds of results that we are looking for. I think looking at those different elements, whether it's uh, in education, agronomic support, um, I think uh, the, the ability and one of the things that we are working on is some sort of a roadmap here in Canada that I've been leading in the last uh, months uh, to try to see what are the kinds of solutions that apply to a specific uh, local environment and what are the kinds of uh, also social and cultural issues that will be barriers for adoption. And I think we need to think about that. We need to think of how to incentivize this, um, uh, not necessarily with funding because there's not gonna be ever that amount, amount of money, but to incentivize, I think the sort of sharing or the adoption by, I would say, creating these kinds of environments, like we are trying with these living laboratories to actually share and adopt an accelerated way, adopt the scans of beneficial management practices. And the last just very quick point, the monitoring and verification, there is a significant effort that we are now just very recently participating uh, internationally to try to uh, strengthen our ability, not only technologically, but also methodological, et cetera, for measuring carbon, uh, carbon uh, sequestration. So we are moving towards that. And I hope that things are gonna uh, materialize in the short term. Thank you again for the invitation here. Thank you. We really, really are running out of time. So just one quick thought, Mike. Quick thought. Um, we've talked about various levels of nature-based solutions some which are really la crème de la crème, if you like, results-based ones. In the EU, but there's very, very different circumstances, that's not going to be the approach for everyone. It will be for some. But if we can get those to work where they can work, but then in lots of other areas, get good basic uh, obligations in place and then funded schemes which operate on a wide area and which work and are well-targeted, if we get those layers and then more sophisticated stuff on top um, where that can function, we would really do very well indeed. We, we shouldn't let perfection be the enemy of something really quite good. And I hope we're, we're moving forward on that. We certainly can. Thanks. Thank you. And Alphonse? Super short. I'm going to go over about, about two minutes unless I can. Yeah, no, I like what Mike said. I, I think that's a great. And I just the thing that I would uh, is know what you want to target. And I think what Mike has said, there are some, some common practices, but then focus on things that you can really deliver on and they're gonna be more elaborate. Anna? We need good R&D and good uh, knowledge exchange and co-creation if we're trying to really um, scale up NBS, which are knowledge intensive. Knowledge intensive, that's a good one. And Karen? 
one mini bite from you. Collaborate with the farmers. I think this transition needs to be led by and 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 listen to farmers. Uh, good policy will meet our needs. And I, th I think there's enough momentum in our sector to want to change. We just need the right kinds of support in place. Good, well, well, thank you, everybody. I, it's certainly an interesting discussion and there's, there's, there's parallels and some differences. And, and I wish we had a bit more time to sort of delve deeper into that. But um, this is a whole new frontier. I think that's very, very plain. It's not the easiest thing to deliver a big change towards nature-based solution in agriculture. We really could, do well from learning from one another and looking at sort of best practice and, and, and sharing as, as much as possible. So I, I, I hope that feeling has been reinforced. Thanks very much to everyone who participated and thank you to all our speakers. Uh, thank you for the team that organized it, including uh, Aline and, and Marianne and Tim and the background and others. And um, I, I hope there'll be another opportunity to talk about these sort of things before too long. Uh, thanks, everybody.